Well, yesterday we made a custom swedge. It took us a little over three hours to make this. I'm pretty darn happy with the results. We'll take a closer look at it. And this is so that we can make our cabinet handles a little bit more efficiently. If I was just making four or five of these, it would never justify the time to make this swedge. But since I need to do nearly three dozen for the next order, I think that it might pay off or at least break even and then I will always have this swedge even if I need to make one I have the swedge and it will go faster in the long run so over the years it will pay off to have made this tool so here is our completed specialty swedge you're never gonna buy one of these in any store you might get lucky and find one in a estate sale or an auction somewhere and make it suit the work you're doing, or modify your work to suit the tool, but in this case we've made a tool to suit the work. Overall this ended up just about four and three quarters inches, and that's not bad. What we'll be doing is sinking a cabinet handle blank, here's the handle, and while it's straight we'll sink it down in that swedge and create the, the nice domed surface that'll be more comfortable to the hand. And this is a hair long, but because of the, the offset where I do the finial ends and the fact that this sweeps down a little bit, I think it's going to work just fine. We'll try it and find out. If not, we'll modify the tool and make it work. So here's our, our handle, and here's our pattern. I know that this is quarter by half material, and I have stamped here cut four inches. So I'm going to go cut three dozen of these four inches long. And then we're going to go over to the forge and we're going to try out our swedge and we're going to make some without using the swedge so you can see how I do that as well. I've got a big pile of parts cut that are ready to forge. I've got a good fire. I've got a couple of pieces in the fire. So let's walk through real quickly just what the basic steps are going to be. Now step one of course is cutting our bar to length. and We've already done that. But step two will be to create a little shoulder here. This is the part that will become the finial and I need to taper that back and you can see that it tapers back and does a, a finial so here's step one and here's step two now to get that shoulder we're going to use the smithing magician or a guillotine tool smithing magician is a brand and the dies that I have in here are butchers and a butcher has this roughly 45 degree top angle and it's not sharp, it's not a cutoff tool and by pinching it between these two I can create a shoulder and start my taper and that makes it very easy so once I've established that and this holds everything steady and in line these are great tools and we'll we'll talk about those in a separate video the next thing to do will be to work it at the edge of the anvil and create that taper then we'll do the finial then once the finials are done we'll sink it in that swedge or free freehand forge a bevel which we'll have to then come back and file even in the swedge I'm pretty sure I'm gonna to have to do some filing on these just to make them smooth and pretty and the final thing before we bend it will be to create these well maybe not the final close to the final thing we'll put some decorative lines in there and we'll put the holes in either we'll punch those or drill them I frequently go ahead and drill those because I don't have a real good small punch at the anvil I need to make one and then we'll bend it and we'll show you how to bend that when we get to it so let's make a couple of these we'll do them a couple of different ways here and I'll keep my sample so I know when I get to the right length drawing things out I want to offset just about a square, so this is half inch, so a half inch bit out of there. Create my shoulder, and then start drawing this back at the edge of the anvil. Now my tongs kind of get in the way here, so a trick is to use the edge of the hardy hole like the edge of your anvil. Another option for that would be a just an anvil block in the hardy hole and that can have a, a crisper edge than your anvil might have. Let's take another look at that. 
a half inch through the sniffing magician and put it over, over the ed far edge and just use this first heat to start drawing that out. That's really all there is to that. And I'm going to turn this one around. I want to create both these edges first and then kind of draw out the middle so I get it just right. You want to keep these about the same thickness. You don't want them getting a lot thicker. And it doesn't hurt to work the edge of the finial because we're going to round that up anyways. Now I've put a chalk mark on here. And from shoulder to shoulder I want four and a quarter inches. So I'm still a good half inch short. So I've got some more drawing out I can do there. I don't mind a little bit of taper in the thickness as I go towards the ends either. My chalk mark is getting hard to see. That's just almost there. By the time I clean up this other end will be there. Making sure my finial is ready to forge when I get to that point, as well as tapering this out some. For such a small project, they can be a little bit on the fiddly side. So that's right at my length mark there. So it's really just cleaning up the profile a little bit. Just trying to get that mass centered here. Then I want to knock the corners off and start kind of rounding up a little bit. Pick a side that's going to be the front. The back is flat. And you can kind of forge this round. And this works pretty well. But they're all going to be just a hair different shape and there's going to be more filing or grinding involved if you want a smooth surface. Which is what I want on these. They don't have to have it, that's just a, an aesthetic consideration. Now you're not going to be able to create a perfect round surface doing it with a hammer. Or not, not a repeatedly perfect. You can get pretty good though. Try and keep the fattest part of the handle in the center. They look, look better that way. So now this one's ready to do the finial on. And you can finish rounding this up after you do the finial. For bean finial, we start with a fairly round shape. We put the, the end we've domed, or the side we've domed down, and we do a half face blow and you set a shoulder and then we go to the peen. We spread that out. Now here I want to start turning and try and get the edges or the bottom sides to drop a little bit. I think that just looks better. And there's our finished finial. There will be a little bit of filing on that. And we'll do the same thing to the other side. And you can do any kind of finial you want on these. You can go back and look at the video on finial ends we did the other day and see a couple of different options. Most people that buy these like the bean finial, but some people like this little spade finial. In that other video we do show how to do the spade. So we'll do the exact same thing again. Face side down. Create a shoulder. Bean from the center to one end from the center to the other end. 
and you can smooth it up with your hammer and a little rotation helps pull the corners down. So that is now ready for just a little bit of cleanup. I'll do some filing on it and I will file my decorative marks, put the holes in it, and then I'll bend it. I like to do all that flat. You could certainly do it after it's done and that may be more efficient, but I feel more comfortable doing it all flat. Now I have a second one that I have not rounded up by hand. It just has the finials done. And those will, I'm going to have to work this end here a little bit and this end here a little bit to keep from messing up the finials. So I may end up trimming that swedge in the long run. But we're going to see how it works. And it's okay if I get a little bit of a curve in this as a result of that. It's not really going to hurt anything. So let's see if that's faster. So again, face side down. And my initial impression is that that was pretty sweet. It's a much nicer round handle and it was much faster to do and I think I'm going to like that switch. I end up with a little bit of a flat here still and I think that's okay because the part your grip is nice and round surface there. I just want to kind of file these smooth and make sure they're going to be comfortable to hold on to. I'm just using a half round file. This is a chance to get rid of any lumps and bumps. It's also a good chance to define your finials a little bit better. Undercutting those a little bit, I just like them better. Round up the ends, and I try and put up just a little bevel. Kind of handy that that actually fits this way. That's looking pretty good. If I take a piece of angle iron and put it in the vise, I keep this hanging on a nail just so I know where it is. This gives me a little something I can flat file better with. Again, I'm just trying to make this smooth. And if you draw file, which is pulling, pulling the file this direction, you end up with a little bit smoother surface. The next thing I want to do is I want to make those two little decorative lines. and an eighth from each end. Once I've done one of these I usually use it as a pattern for all the rest of them so I don't have to ever measure it again. I 
I like these, they're kind of curved, which is why I do them with a file instead of a chisel. But you can do it with a chisel. And that's really about all that needs. That handle is ready to bend. It's going to be comfortable. Knocked all the sharp edges off. And you can come back and do a little more filing when it's done if you need to. Now here's our other piece that we did in the swedge. This hardly needs any filing at all. It's just going to be to shine it up and that may wait till we're all done with it because I just don't see much reason to do it. That worked so nicely. And here I can use this one to mark my place for my decorative lines. I'm just going to center punch these. I use a number eight screw and I like a round head slotted screw looks the best and you can drill these like I say you could hot punch them you can probably even cold punch them at the anvil if you've got a real good sharp punch and a proper bolster block under them me I'm lucky enough to have this Whitney punch it does an excellent job. It says wear and tear on drill bits. If you use one of these for enough years, you can probably pay for it and save drill bits. I don't know how many years that would be though. They aren't cheap. But for production runs, they save me a whole lot of time. So now it's time to bend these. You could bend them over the horn of the anvil. I probably should make a little jig someday that works under the fly press to bend these. That would be quick and simple. But it's not that hard to bend these in the vise. And I'll show you how I do that here in just a second. Let's get them hot. Things like bending these freehand like this would be a real pain, but it really gets easy. And after you do a few, you get pretty good at it. I just lock in the vise to hold the finial. I pull up with the tongs. I'm using about a one, maybe a little bit heavier than one pound ball peen hammer. And I just work that down and get the bend. And by holding with the tongs, I keep it well controlled. So there's one end bent. And there's the second end bent. Now it pays to look at this straight down and make sure that they're not twisted. You want the finials in line with each other. The final forging step is just to put them on the anvil and make sure everything looks flat and straight and that these are going to sit on somebody's kitchen counter just right. Or kitchen cabinets I should say. I don't know why you need a handle on your counter. pretty happy with those. Doesn't hurt to give them a quick wire brushing. And then before they cool, I'll put some paste wax on them. So here is my original sample piece and my test pieces, and here is the one we did using the, the new swedge. This is much cleaner lines, much more elegant looking handle. It's a little bit narrower, although I don't think it has to be. The swedge actually has a little bit more width. But I'm very happy with this. Now the one we did by hand, unfortunately, and this is a problem with the coal fire or becoming distracted in the shop. I was going to tweak it a little bit and I put it back in the fire and then I went to move the camera and I shouldn't have done that. I should have taken it out of the fire. 
You can see I've completely ruined that by burning that up. So don't get distracted. Don't walk away from a coal fire. So there are some other issues that I found as I was doing these working in the coal fire. They're small pieces and they are easy to lose down in the coal. If you've got really good clumped together coal that may not happen so much but mine seem, tends to be rather small pieces and they sink deeper and deeper in the fire and every time I gotta fish them out. You can't work in batches because this is what happens if you leave the blower going and you're working at the anvil. So you've got to just heat things up while you're standing there staring at the fire and that takes a bit of time. In a gas forge that's not such an issue. You set the pressure low enough you can't burn it and you can put three or four of these in the gas forge at one time. For that reason I'm going to pull this little itty bitty gas forge out from under the bench where it's been living, knock the dust off, see if I've got an extra hose and regulator I can put on it or order one real quick. And I'm going to use this. This is the ideal forge for that. It's a real small chamber. I don't need to heat up that great big gas forge. I don't have to worry about the coal fire. And someday we'll cover how this was made. This is as simple and crude of a gas forge as I've ever worked out of. I think there are some simpler ones out there. And who knows, someday we may talk about that. But someday I'll show you how this was made. So that's it. That's a, some simple little cabinet handles. I thought I was going to have 32 more of those that I had to make, but since I burned one up, I've got 33 more of them I have to make. I actually cut 40 pieces of the steel because sometimes things happen and it pays to have a few extras and if they all come out, that gives me a handful extra I can put on the Etsy shop and hopefully there will be some on there. But it pays in production work to always do a few extras because it's easier to do them while you're doing the whole batch than it is to stop and come back and start from scratch when you find out you're one short or one of them just doesn't look right. So you don't need a fancy switch, but it sure helped. I'm really pleased with the way that handle came out. I'm going to keep using the switch. I think it's going to be faster. I didn't have to do any filing on this one. I like it the way it is. So it's a win-win situation all the way around. I hope you liked the video. Give it a thumbs up if you did. Love it if you hit that subscribe button. Feel free to share the video with your friends, share the project, go out and make some cabinet handles, make something else, but get out in the shop, challenge your abilities, learn something new, and just enjoy yourself. It's a precious time to be in the shop. In the meantime, I'm going to get back to work, see if I can get this little forge all hooked up, and we will see you for the next one. Stay safe, wear your safety glasses.